What's the topic today? Born a, Born a leader. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, fantastic. How many believe they are born a leader? Wow. On 24th of January, the year 1956, Elsa was born and she died on 28th of January, 1961, barely five days, or rather four days, to her fifth birthday. She was captured by those who brutally murdered her mother, her captors, and entered into captivity. But her guardian, Joy Adamson, decided to rehabilitate her and take her back to the wild. And she did it so successfully by retraining her how to hunt again. And eventually, when her story was published in Born Free, she won worldwide recognition and fame because very few animals that are locked up in the zoo are able to hunt again. Now, if you lock a wild animal in the zoo for so long and feed him from there and then release him to the wild, you destroy his resourcefulness and he may not be able to hunt. You treat a human being in the same way and you have the same results. You destroy their resourcefulness. And I think partially why Elsa became so popular is not the fact that she was able to regain her freedom, but even more importantly, to regain her identity. She never lost her identity. I wrote you an article and I circulated in our social media platforms that the Siberian tiger is the largest big cat. It's heavier than the lion. Its bite is stronger. But the lion is considered by us humans as the king of the jungle. And I gave an argument which I want to use to build a discourse tonight. Restaurants are physically stronger and more muscular than leaders, presidents, prime ministers, kings, depending on the nation. But kings rule, not treasurers, because physical strength and muscles do not determine a king. You know, you can be the best singer and never produce a music album. You can be the best speaker and never be invited for any serious speaking engagement. You can have the best ideas on earth, but never launch a serious business. You can be the most beautiful girl and never get married, or be a beauty queen, but never qualify for a beauty pageant. The truth is you can have very high IQ and never graduate with a college degree or have good academic credentials but never climb up the corporate ranks and remain at the clerical level far too long. You can even be the most liquid politician and not win an election. We have seen it many times here in Kenya. To me, there could be many factors. But the central missing link in all these instances is personal leadership, leading the self, leading your gift, recognizing who you are and taking charge of yourself. Regrettably, many of us tame potential and allow cravings and urges to be on the loose. Personal leadership requires the opposite. You release potential and you tame urges and cravings. But often time I have wondered, why do we really consider the lion and not the more ferocious tiger, the king of the jungle? First, the tiger leads nobody. It's a lone ranger. It's a solitary animal. There's no leadership without following. There's a Chinese proverb that says, anyone who thinks he's leading and has no follower is taking a walk in the park. You see, one is too small a number for greatness. The strength of a king is a factor of his support system, the people beneath him. That's what keeps him there. Secondary, a lion fights entire lifetime. First, to take over the pride line, and secondly, to maintain the pride. And kings fight for life to maintain the kingdom. In this life, you'll never get what you deserve. You'll get what you demand. You've got to fight for everything you'll ever get. You already have the rights, but you've got to go for it. Thirdly, you realize that a lion has a mane, very beautiful mane. This is a very unique feature that only the lion has. It's interesting that the scriptures do call Christ the lion of the tribe of Judah. They identify him with that. And I suggest tonight you have a crown. You've been crowned a king. 
It is your duty to recognize your nation of origin and the appointing authority and what you're entitled by having that crown as a child of God. Then you realize that lions demarcate their kingdoms. They pick over a domain. Often than not, they have approximately 20 lionesses in the pride line. Of course, they are capped within there, which we don't see with the tiger. It has no kingdom. It has no inference. So that means kings don't necessarily work, labor work, manual jobs. We don't see lions doing the actual hunting. We see them feeding from the prey killed by the lionesses. So they feed from the prey line. And I want to do an analogy from that point to suggest you are never meant to hustle for a lifetime. You are never meant to be a hustler. It's a term that we use here in Kenya so loosely and casually because sometimes we are ignorant of the meaning of words. But you are created for dominion. You are created for authority. You are created to pursue purpose, not to pursue money and success. You are created for authority, not to wrestle and be busy day in, day out for a lifetime. But it's also interesting to tell you tonight that while Elsa was successfully rehabilitated to the wild, she lived for barely five years. And I found out that the average lioness lives for up to 15 years. So she just lived about a third of her true potential. Can I therefore propose, if you overstay in captivity, you risk destroying your potential. You don't have the privilege of time to play around with your freedom. You only have so much time to express your influence and your domain. So I ask you today, at this early stage of our presentation, could you be that tiger, the leader that never led? Could you have tamed the lion on your inside into the zoo of averageness? Could this be the hour to release him to who he really was, not sacrificing his identity. I don't know whether there could be someone who came for this meeting and someone has told you over the years, know your place, know where you belong, know who you are. Maybe there is an employer who has told some of you here, listening to me, you're not employable, were it not for my tender masses. I don't know whether there's a woman in our midst and someone has consistently demeaned you because he's a sole or a main breadwinner. He's made you feel like he's your savior. Were it not for my money, he says, you'll be ragged, dressed, shabby looking. You wouldn't be putting up your hair the way you're doing. Perhaps you and your mother now would be the ghettos, had in time put up a house for her. And literally, you're investigated like a dangerous prisoner, worse off even than your own children, who are twist allowed to go on their own to the shopping mall without a chase car pursuing them. On the outside, you wear expensive jewelry, outfit, and wear an artificial smile to contain your woes. But deep down your heart, your spirit is utterly crushed beyond description. I don't know who could be here tonight, had you been asked to know your place, to know where you belong. If that's you, I'll tell you your place. Your place is that of dominion. Your place is that of rulership. You see, no one can rob away your humanity. It can only be surrendered. Human dignity is not a privilege, it's a right. Because human dignity it's an endowment, it's not an achievement, it's not a factor of how much you have or do not have. What defines you is not how much money you have, it's who you are, your identity. And this cannot be lost unless you personally surrender it. That's why you must never beg for your right, you must never beg for what you're capable to earn. You must never allow others to lower your standards of what God says about you. And if that is you, I'd like to invite you today, I want to share with you some seven principles of personal leadership. 
I've been a keen student of success, and almost every single leader, whether in church, whether in organizations, corporate, governmental, non-governmental, or even in a small team, they consciously apply the principles I'm going to share with you on personal leadership. Deep down their heart, you see leadership is a public trust that is embedded so strongly in the leader, bequeathed from above. A position can be taken away from you at the back of an eyelid. If you're given a position by a corporate organization, the next moment they can snatch it away. But you can lose leadership. It's strongly ingrained on you. I know there are some of you who came because they are leading different organizations and you want to borrow a leaf on how to take your game to the next level. I'm one of you. I also came to learn today. And allow me just to share with you some seven principles on personal leadership and maybe you can go processing them after this meeting. Number one, resilience in defeat. Resilience in defeat. Resilience is the adaptability from a stressful, traumatic, tragic, or even threat situation. Your ability to bounce back from difficult situations, from difficult experiences. At the heart of resilience is the conviction that you're going to emerge victorious. Knowing that no matter how long the night is or how dark it is, the dawn will surely arrive. The belief in yourself and in something higher than you. That thing that tells you you can't afford to give up. And personal leadership calls for tenacity, calls for resilience in defeat, the ability to bounce back when you're hard beaten. You see, if you can lose the battle for your own household, you will surely not win the battle for many households. You should not lead a community. If you go be sacked because of a million laws in your business, then you're going to lose your head if you're running a business worth a hundred million. If you cannot run a kiosk effectively, how will you run a supermarket? If you cannot handle the challenges of a department, the truth is you cannot handle the challenges of the organization. You see, promotion is a factor of your ability to handle pressure and pain and stress. You're paying more to deal with more trouble and more problems. You're not paying more to enjoy the glory and the carpet. That's the truth. So when you're asking for promotion, you're actually asking for more trouble. You're asking for more pain. That's what they pay you for. They pay you to handle pressure. And when they're doing interviews, the one thing they are checking is your ability to handle pressure. If you're running IEBC and you're the chair now, right now in Kenya, <laughs> the commission earns more than a million, but believe me, tonight he's not sleeping. He's paying more to deal with more pressure. The janitor is paid less because he doesn't quarrel with the dust. <laughs> I don't know that we are communicating. Promotion is a factor of your ability to handle pressure. So the moment you say you don't want stress, I can't take it anymore. In essence, what you're saying is, I don't want leadership. That's exactly what you're saying. Leadership sometimes will push you to an awkward position. A position of shame, embarrassment, disdain. And let me suggest this. If you cannot risk embarrassment and shame and mockery and disdain, you are too dignified to lead a revolutionary idea. I'm not suggesting you go looking for trouble after this meeting. <laughs> but history shows with unmistakable emphasis, everyone who is celebrated as a hero, as a global icon, had to deal with controversies and embarrassments and shame, starting with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I may quote a few human characters you may know. We have one true Nobel laureate from this nation, the late Professor Gary Madai. But how many women will start the beatings and the shame defending Karura Forest, defending Uhuru Park? 
but we prefer the glory and the money is now in Green Belt Movement. We celebrate Nelson Mandela and Mahatma Gandhi, some of the greatest icons in the last 100 years, but we don't remember the price they paid. And some leaders paid the ultimate price because there's something in leaders that tells them that we can't stand the status quo. We have to destroy the establishment, something within them that challenges the status quo and the entrenched evil in the society to the extent some of them pay the ultimate price, like Abraham Lincoln abolishing slavery. It cost his life in 1965. The likes of John F. Kennedy or Martin Luther King, both of whom stood against racism. Steve Biko, who died because of opposing apartheid. I want to play for you a clip. And then we're going to pick a lesson out of this. Let's just pick a lesson of leadership. Another mad character has come. They're dancing both of them, but he has the psych. He has the oomph. He has the charisma. He doesn't have the dignity that you guys have. He's putting some energy. That's a very awkward position to be in initially. Someone is doubting his sanity. And Pastor Monica, that's exactly how it starts when you go to church and preach to yourself all alone. And people wonder, did you really hear the calling? <laughs> Why wouldn't you just settle at home? But you realize something is happening. Because when you do something from the depth of your heart, it begins to build inference. I heard of a story, I don't know whether it's true, of a guy who got into a matatu, public transport vehicle, and it was headed from Nairobi to Kisi. He tried to sell oranges, no one bought. So he decided to cut oranges and to eat them mannerlessly. <laughs> <laughs> and immediately everybody wanted to know what's wrong with these oranges. And before he reached restaurants, all the oranges were gone. And then he had to come back and buy more oranges. It worked. Because when you're so crazy with what you're doing, people begin to join you. They start taking you seriously as long as you don't give up. Now, an entire movement is created. From one person, the story has started to spread. So I want to ask this. So what lesson do we pick? Anyone? Yes. Believe in your convictions. Believe in your convictions, even if you're all alone. Anyone else? Yes. Persist in the face of ridicule. Any other lesson? Yes. You, you, can only influence by leading. you can only influence by leading. You can't be telling people that's the place to dance. Go dance. <laughs> the easiest way to tell them is to begin to dance and then make an invitation. There is some enjoy here. There is some fun here. Come over here. But that's the part we don't like. Starting out from the crowd. But when people realize we are getting more and more and we can hide in the crowds, then they feel comfortable <laughs> joining in. But as long as you're all alone in a course, nobody wants to join initially. So the lesson here is this. You've got to be resilient and have that conviction. You see, how ironic it is. We like celebrating our fallen heroes and heroines, but when they were alive, we mortified them. So tonight, let me suggest this. To fortify your psyche in the wave of adversity rather than to be swayed by the torrent, you've got to start on your own believing that it will be all right at the end of the tunnel. You've got to be like a babu in the midst of a hurricane. A babu will bed but will not break. Resilient people, even if they feel broken, they somehow have a conviction. It is just for a time. They will not dwell there for a lifetime. They have that conviction within them. 
So the question is, how do we build resilience? What you need to understand is that resilience is not a special trait in some individuals, like Mandela. Resilience is something that each one of us can learn and develop. How is that? First, if you want to cultivate resilience, team up with resilient people. Not vampires that suck the life and the energy out of you. Each one of us needs cheerleaders from time to time. We all get low, we all get down. You need someone who can tell you, keep on going. You're going to make it. It's going to be all right. So develop social support system within or out of your family that can cheer you up when you're down. <coughs> to cultivate resilience, number two, separate issues from yourself. Do not build your identity from what you're going through. Realize that the situation is temporal. It is not permanent. Failing an academic unit does not make you a failure. Even being discontinued from college, it could mean you're in the wrong course, that you need to join another course. Breaking a relationship does not make you a failure. It calls you to reflect on where you went wrong, on the foundation you built when you began together. If a business closes down, it doesn't necessarily make you a failure. It makes you to reflect on your marketing strategy, your location, what went on, clarify your calling. It doesn't define you. Separate issues from you, from your identity. Don't build your identity around struggles and failures and defeats. To cultivate resilience, you need to be self-aware. Cultivate self-awareness. Now, I must say this. Staying strong in the midst of adversity is a desirable, a coveted trait that I encourage for each one of you. But a prideful stubbornness that refuses to ask for help may lead you to stress fractures or even emotional gracias. You need to listen to your mind, to your body cues, to the signals your body is sending to know when to go for extra help. You need to sense when physiologically and physically you need intervention from another quarter, not just putting a strong face forward just to stay afloat for the sake of it while you're still perishing from your inside. Each one of us needs somewhere to reach out. To cultivate resilience, you need self-acceptance, number four. Self-acceptance. That means when you're planning and setting goals, you've got to set your own goals. Not too low goals that don't inspire growth. Important goals that leave you at the same point for too long. But at the same time, be sure you're setting your own goals. You're not setting goals for others to impress the rest of the audience around you that you'll never be satisfied. Be sure you're setting your own goals. <coughs> to build resilience, you've got to accept pain as part of life. No doubt each one of you here has gone through pain and some of you could be in pain as I speak to you. You see, when we are in pain, we want to get out as quickly as possible. And when we are not in pain, we want to help our loved ones who are in suffering to get out of it as quickly as possible. But I suggest tonight that resilient people recognize pain and stress to be seasons in this life that we've got to go through. They are receding tides. They don't dwell for good. And when we understand that, we are able to lean on the waves and to focus on the next shift. Denying pain, rejecting it, or repressing it does not eliminate it. And you are either in trouble or headed for trouble or you have just emerged out of trouble. That's just the reality of this life. Thank God if you're not in trouble, the likelihood that you're not in trouble is very high. That's why you made it for the meeting today. You might need this message tomorrow. These are seasons. So you've got to accept that. And to build resilience lastly, I suggest this. Realize that you don't have to have all the answers in life. Uh, this nation, we are very interested in people. We like explaining everything. So if I fail in business, stop writing for a moment. Look at my eye. Look at my eye, every one of you. Do you remember that owl that sat on our house roof when we were growing up? 
That's what is causing this tumor. You remember my stepmother who looked at me with some wicked eyes? That's what made my husband run away. You know, there are many people who feel they must give an explanation and a reason for whatever happens in their life. I want to suggest to you, be comfortable not explaining everything. You don't have to have the answers to everything that happens in your life. The dots will add up someday, but you don't have to force that day to be today. Let the river take its course. What is critical for you to realize tonight is that resilience is not a passive quality, but an active process that you can cultivate, that you can build, that you can develop. Principle number two. Personal leadership principle number two. I'll call it modesty in victory. Modesty in victory. People with personal leadership are humble with success. They are modest where they enjoy victories. They don't make everyone else around them feel like they have lost it. See, we come from a part of the world where many people around us are not doing so well. You're not responsible for it, nor am I even suggesting you go to their level. But as you celebrate your victory, you've got to realize their thinking patterns so that you don't end up irritating an already wounded person. You see, I've seen people, well, the people flashing bashes at the glare of the hungry, people suffering in famine or someone who didn't even have the meal for the last three days. I've seen politicians going bizarre because of winning an election. I've seen students graduating from universities revering for two days until they lose their mind. In 1992, after graduating from the University of Chicago, Rudney started a restaurant which he called pa pa Paneros Mexican Grill. Now, he is a guy with an MBA. He had enough employees, he had some good capital. But he decided to literally do every single job in that restaurant. So he decided to cook food for a week. He decided to be a janitor for a week. He decided to be a cashier for a week. He decided to wash dishes for a week. He decided to be a waiter for a week. He was interviewed later on by Business Insider and he said, I wanted to have a feel of every single duty in this restaurant so that I may understand what my employees, the type of support that the employees may need from me. What I see in Kenya is the opposite. If somebody has a corporate position and they have a tea girl in the office, you suddenly forget how to make coffee for yourself. She has to come and fix it for you. You start a business and you know you can get cheaper equipment downtown, but you deliberately buy twice the price in up market, lest people confuse where you belong. <laughs> Interesting country we are in. I was once mediating a process, strategic planning, in a corporate organization. And the ICT manager was presenting, I was trying to help them. I did their main strategic plan and also the ICT strategy. During the presentation to the board, he deliberately switched to technical jargon. Even, from, even me for a while, I got lost. And I had to ask him, please, who are you talking to? And I'm not suggesting this is only common with ICT guys, but please, nobody's doubting your academics unless you're doubting yourself. I had a story, this is not original with me. A five-year-old boy asked the father, uh, Dad, what is tragedy? And the father said, well, that's upheaval. <coughs> okay, Dad, what's upheaval? That's a disaster, Dad. What's a disaster? It's a calamity. What's a calamity? Catastrophe! What is catastrophe? Catalyst! Oh. <laughs> I don't know that it's a true story. But I don't know how many here have seen some of the guys who work with you deliberately using a technical jargon just to impress others. Does that happen in the workplace? Yes. And then you realize you're not communicating. 
you're not communicating. All employers who tell employees, you know, I feed your house, I feed your family. And all these guys who are working here, I'm the one feeding them. That's not true. You're not feeding them. They are earning for their money. They are working for themselves. They are feeding themselves. Husbands, or even sometimes wives, who tell their spouses, depending on who is the main breadwinner, were it not for my money? Again, that's not true because marriage is a covenant, not a contract. When you came together, you have one account. Whether it's literal or not, this is a covenant. It's joint ownership of everything you have. While still, even fathers who, or mothers who even tell their children day in, day out, were it not for my money, you wouldn't be in school. One must be very sick to tell a child such words who did not apply to be sired in that house. Thank God none of you says such things. <laughs> what I'm suggesting today, modesty doesn't mean becoming a sitting duck, a champ for others to sit on. Modesty, or rather humility, is not even denying your strengths, but accepting your weaknesses. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Having a true picture, a true perspective of yourself, having a real perspective of who you are, an accurate estimate of who you are. You see, humble people don't have to prove a lot. Humility is an asset to the one who owns it because you're not under pressure from the society's labels to prove something, to impress others. You're not under pressure to perform to an audience out there. So even when loss and frustrations come along a humble ego, you're able to handle it much more because nobody wants to do with egomaniacs, not even God. The